Um, my objectives today are uh, to discuss the rationale for coronary physiology assessment. Um, next, I'll describe the elements of an invasive physiology study, um, and I'll just share some brief technical details. And then um, last is that I'll introduce the Discover Anoka registry, which uh, just went live last week. So the whole reason to talk about this um, with a group of interventional cardiologists uh, is that chest pain is really in the wheelhouse of what we do um, day to day. Uh, if you go back to the, um, you know, the original chest pain guidelines um, that were based on the Diamond Forrester pretest probabilities of finding obstructive coronary artery disease, this has really informed a lot of, uh, of what we do. Um, Diamond Forrester looked at autopsies and angiograms and essentially tried to find a true prevalence of coronary artery disease. Uh, what they published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1979 was um, that the prevalence of coronary artery disease depended on people having angina. And so they classified people as having non-anginal chest pain, atypical angina, or typical angina. Men with typical angina between 60 and 69 had the highest prevalence. But starting from that point and going down, um, you'll see that even women with typical angina between 40 and 49 really only had a 50% chance of having obstructive coronary artery disease. So these are people with typical angina, um, but more, you know, almost half of them don't have uh, obstructive coronary artery disease. And then if you look at atypical symptoms or what we call now call possibly cardiac symptoms, um, for women, the numbers are even worse that, you know, 50 to 59, um, somewhere around 70% of people presented with some chest pain sy symptoms without having obstructive coronary artery disease. And the same is true of men. So this is not a problem that's just um, isolated in women. And so when we look at this to inform uh, us about um, the prevalence of coronary artery disease, we should also think about the prevalence of uh, disorders that can cause chest pain without coronary artery disease. In uh, 2010, Manesh Patel published this um, paper looking at NCDR data um, and people who underwent coronary angiography for um, suspected ischemic heart disease. They excluded people who were getting preoperative testing, who already had known coronary artery disease, had prior MIs, prior PCI, or prior CABG. They looked at 400,000 patients at 663 uh, hospitals in NCDR, and they wanted to say, how often do we find obstructive coronary artery disease? So in this analysis, which um, uh, I think Jephthah um, can tell us has some flaws to it, but uh, is um, as good as we can get for a sample this size, 59% of patients uh, did not have a stenosis greater than 50%. And so these are all people who underwent um, an angiogram in the cath lab. And only 38% of patients had a stenosis greater than 70%, which is really telling us that um, the diagnostic yield of invasive coronary angiography for, for assessing angina or ischemic heart disease is really um, not great. Even if you use non-invasive testing to try to inform your judgment uh, and symptoms, a positive stress test with angina, you get somewhere around 55% um, uh, in terms of the prevalence of obstructive CAD. If people don't have symptoms or if they have uh, possibly cardiac or atypical symptoms, it's even worse, even with a positive stress test. And then if you have a negative stress test uh, or no stress testing, those numbers are even uh, lower that, you know, somewhere around 20 to 40% of people will have coronary artery disease, but then the balance of those, um, which is really the majority, will not have coronary artery disease, um, but still had symptoms that led them to a cardiac cath. More recently, this is a paper that was just published in the New England Journal of Medicine called the Discharge Study. Um, this looked at 3,561 patients with uh, intermediate pretest probability of having coronary artery disease who presented with stable angina. 56% of the people in this study were women, and they were randomized to either coronary CTA or invasive coronary angiography. The results of this study essentially showed that there was no difference um, in outcomes uh, if you're using uh, CTA versus invasive coronary angiography as your first test for assessing uh, stable chest pain. But more importantly, they also uh, essentially had um, some data about the prevalence of obstructive CAD. So um, in their cohort, uh, only 26% of people had coronary uh, artery disease with a stenosis greater than 50%. And that's either by CTA or invasive uh, coronary angiography. So that means that almost 75% of the people in this study did not have obstructive CAD, but still presented with a stable chest pain. Revascularization only occurred in 14% in the CTA group and 18% in the invasive uh, coronary angiography group. And so really when we're using um, these anatomic uh, test to try to find obstructive coronary artery disease, 
the minority of patients get revascularized, uh, and um, the majority of patients may uh, have chest pain from um, syndromes other than coronary artery disease. So the syndromes that um, lead people to the, you know, to come to our attention, um, they have names that aren't necessarily part of our common practice. So I just want to go over the nomenclature. So if you use ischemic heart disease as the uh, umbrella term um, for, for what we're treating as cardiologists, people present with stable syndromes, and that can be broken up into either obstructive coronary artery disease um, or ANOCA, which is ischemia and no obstructive coronary artery disease. So uh, ANOCA is due to coronary microvascular dysfunction, coronary vasospasm, myocardial bridges. There's other syndromes like uh, elevated resting flow that are maybe less common. The second part of ischemic heart disease is acute coronary syndromes. And so patients can uh, present with unstable angina, and stemmies or stemmies. And then the correlate uh, in the absence of an obstructive coronary artery lesion is MINOCA or a myocardial infarction with no obstructive coronary artery disease. And Minoka is due to plaque erosion, cardiomyopathies, or vasospasm. There can be other abnormalities with the arteries themselves if you look um, by OCT imaging, um, leading to elevated troponins, uh, abnormal EKGs, um, and true clinical uh, myocardial infarction. So a couple of myths um, that are um, unfortunately pervasive. So the first myth is that ANOCA is benign, uh, and that essentially if you rule out obstructive coronary artery disease, you've essentially risk stratified the patient and that um, anything else is less uh, of an issue. But I wanna point out that, the, uh, that people with ANOCA have a high burden of angina and an impaired quality of life. Um, some studies have shown that uh, Seattle Angina Questionnaire Summary Scores are lower for ANOCA than they are for um, stable CAD, people who undergo elective TCIs, people who have had MIs. And so this can be a very afflicted population in terms of symptoms. A meta-analysis meta of patients uh, with coronary microvascular dysfunction diagnosed by um, many different modalities showed that uh, there's a signal of uh, four times higher mortality and five times higher uh, MACE um, if people have microvascular dysfunction um, compared to, to people who don't. And then these patients, as we have all seen, uh, uh, have increased healthcare utilization, increased uh, recidivism where they come back um, with persistent symptoms. And so I wanna really point out that ANOCA is many patients and it truly affects quality of life. The second myth is that Minoka is benign. So these are patients who come to our attention while they're hospitalized. Um, they have uh, every clinical sign of, a, of an MI, but when they come down to the cath lab, they have normal coronary arteries. Again, once we do an angiogram, um, we often say that we've risk stratified them, but uh, Minoka uh, has a high rate of MACE and mortality. So multiple cohort studies have shown a high rate of mortality. Um, even greater than 10% at five years. Um, I want to point out that fatal heart attacks can occur in the absence of coronary artery um, stenosis. This may be more prevalent in women. And uh, a study published uh, last year called harp Minoka, um, which uh, where people with Minoka presented um, and underwent OCT imaging uh, of all three vessels or cardiac MRIs, uh, people had abnormalities in 85%. Uh, of the cases. And so um, these are people who do have true pathology. Um, and so just because we've cleared the epicardial vessels does not mean that um, we should stop looking. This looks at, um, this figure right here is just representing um, uh, mortality rates uh, at five years. And so um, if an MI gives you a 15% um, five-year mortality rate, Minoka is not far behind. So um, what do our guidelines say? How do we assess people with uh, chest pain um, and no obstructive coronary artery disease? So um, just uh, in the most recent um, ACC AHA chest pain guidelines, there's now a 2A recommendation for um, invasive coronary function testing to um, improve our diagnos uh, diagnosis. And then this was already in the um, 2019 ESC uh, chronic coronary syndrome guidelines that um, further testing for patients who present with chest pain uh, without a clear cause um, and no obstructive coronary artery disease should undergo functional testing. This is a quote from a luminary in interventional cardiology um, who said this a few weeks ago. This is like neurology. There's nothing that can be done. This kind of therapeutic nihilism really um, is not fair to our patients uh, and it doesn't really reflect the state of the art. 
So um, in 2018, the Cormica trial um, was a randomized trial of stratified medical therapy for patients with um, ischemia and no obstructive coronary artery disease. So essentially repurposing the agents that we have available um, to uh, try to improve um, symptoms uh, and quality of life in patients with ANOCA. So um, this was 151 patients at um, essentially three hospitals uh, who were randomized um, uh, in the UK uh, to either uh, uh, getting the results of physiology testing disclosed to the patient and the referring provider or being blinded. All of these patients underwent invasive physiology testing. The only difference is that the results were disclosed in half um, and blinded in the other. So blinding the results is essentially the standard of care of what we do now. And then um, disclosing the results is uh, really um, what I'm trying to, to recommend today. Um, and the medical therapy was uh, stratified based on the diagnosis. Both groups of patients received the same recommendations. So beta blockers for microvascular disease, calcium channel blockers, and nitrates for vasospasm, uh, lifestyle modification for both groups. And so essentially, uh, the providers could um, pick the, what they wanted to do based on those recommendations, based on what they suspected or what they knew the diagnosis was. So um, these were the phenotypes that they used um, broadly. So vasospastic angina, and that was proved by acetylcholine provocation. Um, people who didn't have microvascular disease by invasive testing, those patients were recommended smoking cessation, calcium channel blockers, nitrates, and lifestyle modification. Microvascular disease was a reduced coronary flow reserve or an uh, elevated index of microcirculatory resistance um, and no evidence of vasospasm. And so those patients were recommended beta blockers, cardiac rehab, um, and to consider ACE inhibitors or statins. And then finally, non-cardiac chest pain. And these patients were essentially asked to stop antianginal therapy and um, be discharged from, um, from cardiovascular care. So Cormica resulted in a significant improvement in uh, angina burden and the quality of life with stratified medical therapy. So in these two figures that I've shown, um, you can see the treatment effect. So uh, this is uh, the baseline Seattle Angina Questionnaire summary score, which is really low. So if you look at the ischemia trial, people with obstructive coronary artery disease were somewhere around 70 to start. And so um, the lower score means uh, um, worse symptoms. With uh, disclosing the results of the um, functional testing, the intervention group, <clears throat> um, you can see that there's a significant improvement, 22% in the um, Seattle Angina uh, questionnaire summary score compared to the control group um, who underwent the same testing but didn't have the results disclosed. And this was persistent um, at six months and 12 months. The same effect is seen in quality of life where um, going forward at six months and at 12 months, you have an ongoing and incremental benefit um, where people continue to have improved quality of life with stratified medical therapy. We've noticed this in our cohort as well. So patients have um, gotten back to me, essentially uh, telling me um, how they feel with uh, stratified medical therapy. A lot of these patients have already had care elsewhere, um, multiple prior um, stress tests and angiograms, and you can see that um, people uh, really do feel better. All right. so. Um, Please feel free to stop me if you have any questions. I'm gonna talk about a little bit um, about the um, elements of an invasive physiology study. Um, and if you have technical questions, please let me know. Hey, Smith, this is Steve. Can I ask a question about what you said so far? Yeah, of course. Can you comment on what we know about um, the interaction of, of mental health diagnoses with um, Anoka and Anoka, or, or where there's efforts to look at that. For example, I'm just thinking about the um, impact of depression, for example, on outcomes in other, in, in obstructive coronary disease. Yeah, it's a great point. So, you know, when we, um, when we talk about all of these prevalences and things like that, um, we're talking about static, um, static things, but uh, it's really, you know, as humans, what really differentiates us is that we are emotionally responsive to things. Um, and so both acute and chronic stress um, can lead to people, uh, lead people to present um, with new symptoms. Um, and we've all seen this, that MIs happen after stressful events. Um, I, you know, Carlos and Vamos have shown that depression leads to worse outcomes in peripheral arterial disease. And then uh, kind of as a pilot study, we've done mental stress uh, testing 
um, to look at microvascular disease. And physiologically, microvascular resistance does increase with stress. And so um, when we you know, talk about data and, and registries, we're really looking at that one static data point. But um, it's a great point that it's important to keep in mind that um, situational um, factors can result in stress uh, and, and new symptoms as well. And so it's, you know, it's important to keep that in mind. All right, so um, kind of to that point. So, uh, you know, this is a coronary circulation, just to broadly recap. So we, you know, we spend a lot of time looking at epicardial vessels. This is a, um, an image from uh, Attila Ferrer from a review that he wrote with Alcinousis uh, a couple of years ago. You can see um, this is a corrosion cast showing the epicardial vessels. And then you see really the abundance of these um, perforating um, microvascular arterioles. This, you, see, you see it in cross section where you see the epicardial vessel here on the surface and then the um, microvascular vessels uh, essentially going into the muscle. Um, and the, the main point here is that the epicardial vessels are the highway. Um, so these are the, the vessels that bring blood down, but really most of the perfusion of the, uh, the cardiac tissue happens at the level of the microcirculation. And so um, we see the epicardial vessels uh, in the cath lab, which is why we focus on them so much. It's also something that we can mechanically treat with a, uh, a stent. Um, but really, uh, the microcirculation is um, hugely important and um, really determines outcomes for many patients. When we're invasively assessing patients, we have to take into account the epicardial vessels, the microcirculation, then the endothelium. So um, we try to compartmentalize things. And so, uh, you know, with pharmacological probes, we have adenosine, which binds to adenosine A2 receptors on vascular smooth muscle. And so if we're doing a fractional flow reserve, that's what we're um, really trying to stimulate is vasodilation at that level. That's a non-endothelium dependent mechanism. And so regardless of endothelial function, we can still check a fractional flow reserve, augment coronary flow by using adenosine. Um, I'll talk about acetylcholine, uh, which binds to the um, muscarinic acetylcholine receptors on the endothelial cells, and that releases nitric oxide. So that's an endothelium-dependent mechanism. Both of these are vasodilators. So acetylcholine is, um, uh, I think some people think of it as a vasoconstrictor, but it really is a vasodilating medication um, if the endothelium is intact. Uh, if the endothelium is not intact, uh, you get essentially uh, metabolites that lead to vasoconstriction, and that's what... Um, what we see with coronary uh, artery spasm. And then to further compartmentalize, we talk about the epicardial vessel <clears throat> in a fractional flow reserve. That's again, adenosine dependent. And then I'll talk a little bit <clears throat> more about the index of microcirculatory resistance um, and how we use adenosine to uh, essentially derive that. With acetylcholine, we can look at epicardial spasm and then we can uh, essentially um, indirectly look at microvascular spasm. So our protocol that we've been doing for a couple of years now is that if we have a patient with sus uh, suspected ischemic heart disease, we bring them to the cath lab. They have angiographically normal coronary arteries or really minimal uh, coronary artery disease. We'll proceed with acetylcholine testing first. If they have a stenosis that looks really compelling. We may proceed with um, FFR and then um, thermodilution to look at the microcirculatory resistance and then uh, acetylcholine after, uh, after that. As our comfort with this has grown, we've really um, been doing acetylcholine testing uh, more frequently. And so usually um, the path that we follow is um, coronary angiogram, acetylcholine, and then guide wire-based testing. Um, Stephanie presented uh, our procedural findings um, at Sky, uh, And on average, this takes us about 56 minutes for the entire um, testing uh, protocol. So for acetylcholine um, provocation, uh, the way we're doing this is bolus injections. We had started off using microcatheters, um, but it's uh, more trouble than it's worth. And so what we do, um, pharmacy uh, can sterilely compound this and send it up in um, five syringes. For the left coronary, we inject um, two mLs uh, over one minute. We have three doses um, really that we use for the left coronary. So um, this should be two micrograms um, and then 20 micrograms and 100 micrograms. We have a final dose of 200 micrograms, and that's really most effective in men. Women uh, tend to saturate at 100 micrograms. For the right coronary artery, um, the, the doses are generally lower. Remember with the right coronary artery, the risk of bradyarrhythmias uh, and tachyarrhythmias uh, is higher. And so we um, uh, have essentially stopped testing the right coronary artery um, just because it, it does uh, 
lead to some safety concerns. Patients should have Zoll pads on. They should have two good IVs, um, and everybody should be watching the EKG. Um, patients do get heart block. They do have sinus arrest, um, and they can get hypotensive. And so um, it's really important to be watching the, the EKG continuously. If they do block, um, the you know you want to obviously be ready to give atropine or to pace. Um, but as long as you slow your injection, you can generally give the full dose, um, and just you just have to wait for these uh, EKG changes to to resolve. Um, so during the EK, uh, acetylcholine bolus, we evaluate for uh, symptoms um, or ischemic uh, EKG changes. After waiting about a minute, we will record a 12-lead EKG. And then we perform a CINE uh, angiogram to look for epicardial spasm or slow flow to, to suggest microvascular spasm. And then at the end uh, of the acetylcholine, um, after giving all of the doses, we'll inject nitroglycerin. If necessary, acetylcholine can be reversed with atropine. So after we do acetylcholine testing, we pro uh, proceed with coronary thermodilution. So this is guide wire based testing. It's a pressure wire um, that uh, we had been using at the VA for clinical purposes um, as far back as 2015. Um, it's called the Pressure Wire X. It's, it has a wireless connection um, and we have a Coroflow uh, console both at um, York Street and SRC. So this is to assess flow reserve by um, doing thermodilution down the vessel of choice. And then uh, we can uh, derive microloop circulatory resistance um, extrapolating from Ohm's law. So um, in this picture, you see a guide catheter, the wire, which is across a potential lesion. So you, uh, just like an FFR, have a PD and a PA. Um, and that epicardial part of it is a fractional flow reserve. If you include the microcirculation, that's the index of microcirculatory resistance. And then the whole circuit is the um, coronary flow reserve. So um, always give nitroglycerin before you put the wire down to correct for wire-induced spasm. Um, and then this also corrects for uh, adenosine flow-mediated vasodilation, which can be um, variable uh, in each patient. Get the wire as distally as possible. Usually the LED is the uh, most favorable wire just because you, because you can get it far, far enough down. But if the RCA is better or if the circumflex is big and you have a long marginal, that's fine too. You bolus three cc's of saline. Um, you repeat this three times and the console kind of talks you through what, when to do this. And then um, you'll uh, administer uh, adenosine IV to induce hyperemia. And then after two to three minutes of hyperemia, you would then do um, saline injections again to come up with a new set of thermodilution curves. So if you're comparing your hyperemic flow to your um, uh, resting flow, that's a coronary flow reserve. And so less than 2.5 is abnormal. Remember, this is vessel specific, so the coronary flow reserve of the LAD is higher than the other vessels, and so um, we will see uh, CFRs of you know six, seven, eight, nine, ten um, in the LAD. And so, uh, if it is lower than two point five, it's in general it, it is pretty abnormal. And then um, using uh, your hyperemic um, flow and then the distal coronary pressure, you can uh, come up with an index of microcirculatory resistance, which is really well validated. Um, and so greater than uh, or equal to 25 is abnormal and suggestive of micro, uh, coronary microvascular dysfunction. Uh, Dr. Shek, quick question, like in the last slide. When you say like a CFR goes up to like a six, is it true value or erroneous value? It's a true value. So um, with, within the confines of doing this in a vessel specific um, way, uh, that's representative of the, the augmentation of flow that happens down that vessel. So your CFR values will generally be higher in the LED than they will in any other vessel. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, it's not an erroneous, it's not an error or a technical problem. It's, um, that's actually representing the, the augmentation of flow. So it can augment up to like three times or like four times. Four times is the conventional, yeah, is the conventional um, teaching that uh, coronary circulation can increase its blood flow by 400%. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is a cartoon um, that uh, was um, the kind of developed by uh, a couple of um, working groups, both in the United States and then internationally. Um, this was presented at TCT. So this is um, for this guide wire part of it, uh, kind of, you know, a poster that we can put up. So CAT CMD. So um, giving you just best practices for catheter engagement, getting your wire distally, giving nitro, um, the three uh, baseline injections, the three hyperemic injections, and then the values for um, coronary flow reserve or IMR. Uh, 
So um, I have a couple of cases. Uh, and so, um, you know, feel free to ask if you have any questions about these. Um, these were kind of uh, recent cases for us. So first patient, 67 year old man has hypertension and diabetes, prior COVID-19 infection months prior to his first presentation, presented to the ER with chest pain um, one year ago. After that initial presentation a year ago, um, he's had two hospital admissions, five ER visits, uh, with chest pain, two coronary angiograms, um, two spec stress tests, and then eventually, um, due to cardiology provider fatigue, was referred to GI and had an endoscopy. Again, presented with chest pain, elevated troponin um, in the uh, high sensitivity troponin in the 60s, uh, and was finally sent um, for functional testing. So I'll show you his first angiogram. So um, circumflex, really free of disease. LAD has some kind of moderate disease. And then his RCA has some luminal irregularities, but he had a um, spec stress test that had mid to apical inferior ischemia. And so he um, underwent an uh, IFR of the uh, RCA, which was 0 0.91. Came back for a second quarter angiogram. Um, circumflex is uh, essentially normal still. You see the LED disease again. He underwent a fractional flow reserve of the LED. So the FFR there is 0.87. Continued to have ongoing symptoms um, and ongoing presentations. And then um, when he most recently presented, he was referred for um, functional testing. And so uh, first picture is our diagnostic angiogram. Second picture is with 20 micrograms of acetylcholine. And you see that he spasmed his entire LED in diagonal. And then when you go to 100 micrograms, um, you see it comes back even more proximally. Really, the entire LED is gone. Um, you see the distal circumflex is also spasmed. So he's the the finding after the 20 micrograms. Why go to the 100? What's so incremental? The, the yeah, so diagnostic criteria for vasospasm um, and trying to respect the specificity of the diagnosis um, is greater than 90% spasm of the epicardial vessels. Uh, presence of ischemic EKG changes, and then um, reproduction of presenting uh, symptoms. And so this is, you know, questionably 90% in the 20 micrograms. Um, I think it's more clearly 90% in the 100 micrograms. Um, and so uh, to make sure that we're being, you know, thoughtful of the specificity of that, that's one reason to go to 100 micrograms. He also didn't have significant EKG changes at 20. And so with 100 micrograms, the diagnosis is really clear that this is um, his predominant syndrome. And I'm assuming you'll go over the rescue protocols. Yep. So then we give him nitroglycerin. Um, we give him 200 micrograms. Um, and so his symptoms and EKG changes resolved. Uh, and then um, you can see that uh, this is what it looks like at uh, spasm. And then this is uh, with the NTG, the nitroglycerin, what it looks like after you give him some nitro. So we then proceeded with our guide wire based testing. You see down in the corner, this we have our wire really distally um, uh, in the LAD. So um, his FFR of the LAD was 0.89. Um, this picture, starting with the yellow line, the yellow line is the PDPA and continuum, both at rest and then eventually at hyperemia. You see the pressure tracing, the uh, red pressure tracing is your um, proximal tracing, the green is your distal, and so this is your PDPA. Uh, across the timeline. And then all of these white lines are essentially thermodilution curves. And then you see those individual curves down at the bottom. So his resting thermodilution transit time, so this is reflective of resting flow for which there's no reference uh, value was 0.93. Then we give him adenosine um, and uh, that's the orange curve down here. Um, we repeat the saline injections uh, and then your um, hyperemic transit time is 0.35. So he ends up having an elevated IMR as well. So um, indicative of some level of microvascular dysfunction. Um, this, uh, this finding was um, uh, reported uh, last year by a group from Japan, where essentially if you look at um, patients with spasm, um, you're more likely in, those, uh, in the spasm vessel to have an elevated uh, IMR, which is um, interesting, um, not really clear um, why that is, but uh, we see that quite a bit as well. So um, the patient then followed up uh, as an outpatient actually pretty recently. And so um, 
He arrives to the visit alone, reports that his chest uh, discomfort has resolved over the last three weeks. He feels really good now. He's been performing his usual activities and remained active, does not experience chest discomfort, shortness of breath, or other anginal exertional symptoms. Um, and then he appropriately uses his medical therapy nitro patches. And so um, this was kind of mission accomplished for us that um, it took a little while for him to get there, but we got him a diagnosis um, and got him feeling better. So Second case, what, go ahead. What do you label his uh, uh, case as? Like both the micro, uh, micro uh, vasospastic angina as well as uh, uh, endotype, what type of endotype? Yeah, so he's going to be, t uh, technically he's mixed, right, Va uh, vasospasm and uh, microvascular dysfunction. But if you talk to him, his symptoms are clearly consistent with spasm. He has uh, both exertional angina and then episodes of angina at rest um, that could be increasingly severe. They last a few minutes and then they um, eventually, you know, he has some ongoing chest pain, but mostly uh, um, it resolves uh, or gets better. And so um, the cadence of his symptoms was uh, vasospastic angina. Okay. And how, how is it like clinically microvascular dysfunction uh, symptoms are different than vasospastic angina, except that like they're provocating vasospasm events, but... Well, so remember, so microvascular dysfunction is, um, it's both the diagnosis and um, it just represents the physiology that's present. And so he has some level of non-endothelium dependent um, microvascular dysfunction. And so this is a patient who has multiple risk factors. And we've, you know, people have talked about this um, hypertension. He has poorly controlled diabetes. Um, and so we've seen this from PET flow reserve studies as well, that both of those things can correlate to having an abnormal CFR. So um, it's not really that surprising that he has some degree of microvascular dysfunction. But um, this really is, it go, it's to the point of doing the, you know, the whole protocol and doing the acetylcholine testing, because if we were to only do the guide wire based testing, we'd, he'd get this diagnosis of microvascular dysfunction. And then if you're trying to base his medical therapy on that, it, could, it can mis uh, mislead you. All right, so second case, um, I'm gonna blame myself here. So this is a 70 year old woman who uh, has hypertension and hyperlipidemia, presents with exertional chest pain and shortness of breath. This patient was actually referred back to me. Um, I had done a coronary angiogram on her in 2019 before I had started doing functional testing. Um, her uh, story started with exer exertional angina and she had an abnormal stress echo um, with anterior and apical ischemia. Um, was medically managed, uh, and then I did an angiogram on her at St. Raphael's in 2019. She has this LAD disease that I thought was pretty compelling, um, but an FFR of that uh, was 0.83. So um, she was medically managed at that point in 2019 and initially did okay, uh, but then came back this year uh, with ongoing um, ongoing symptoms. Uh, and so she was referred back and this time um, we were ready to do a functional test. Based on the LED last time, I thought that was going to be um, significant epicardial disease. But if you look at uh, essentially his, it looks similar to the way it did three years ago. Um, FFR of it now was 0.83. We give her acetylcholine. She doesn't have spasm. Um, in fact, she um, vasodilates the distal part, uh, but um, this proximal part that has atherosclerosis angiographically uh, doesn't vasodilate, so likely has some endothelial uh, dysfunction there. So then um, I, I can't get the coroflow snapshot for this one. It didn't come over, but basically she had microvascular dysfunction, um, an IMR of uh, 47, coronary flow reserve of 1.5. She had um, uh, suggestion of microvascular spasm during acetylcholine. And so she had uh, both um, deep ST depressions and chest discomfort, um, coronary endothelial dysfunction, like we talked about, and then her um, FFR, um, which I told you was non-obstructive. So um, we increased her beta blocker and then eventually got her into cardiac rehab and got her onto an ACE inhibitor. So she followed up recently um, with her primary cardiologist. Uh, and then uh, Remarkably, her chest pain has resolved. Um, and so she's actually doing great. She's, um, I think, halfway through cardiac rehab and really enjoying it and feeling a lot better. So um, another case that was not necessarily straightforward, but um, we're able to get her a clear diagnosis. Samit, can you comment on what role, um, you know, kind of giving these patients a diagnosis might have played? I mean, going back to Cormica, 
Yeah, it's a great question. So we um, we don't really know the you know how that quantifies. Um, uh, Mara Maya is a medical student um, who's working with us. She's on this call uh, and she's interviewing these patients um, for a project that's funded by the FDA. Um, and you know, it's I call it the spiritual experience. Uh, you know, if if I were to think about um, as a comparison how patients react when you revascularize them after a STEMI. It's really um, amazing how uh, how good people feel when you give them a diagnosis. Um, and so I'm not sure if, how much of the therapeutic effect of this is actually giving a diagnosis so people can put their symptoms in context. Um, but you know, multiple patients have tried um, on four or five when you tell them what's going on. Um, a lot of these patients have been afflicted for a long time. And so I think in addition to medical therapy that um, you know, revelation of the diagnosis uh, has some therapeutic benefit. So um, with uh, the last 10 minutes, I wanted to introduce the Discover Anoka Registry. So this is a study that um, was born from the um, pilot work that we did locally, um, and we're uh, grateful to be funded to, to do this on a much bigger scale. So um, to the, you know, in the spirit of everything that we've talked about today, we want to look at ischemic heart disease in a much broader sense. So obstructive coronary artery disease, but expanding that to include microvascular dysfunction, vasospastic angina, mixed syndromes, and then other things like mental stress, like Dr. Fowl mentioned, myocardial bridging, and elevated resting flow. So the Discover uh, Anoka Prospective Multicenter Registry um, is uh, a multicenter study to really um, expand on this paradigm. So. The goals of this registry are number one, to describe the prevalence of specific uh, physiologic phenotypes in patients who um, come to the cath lab with ANOCA. This is only being done um, in cath labs. And so this is the first time that we're uh, in a multi-center study doing this um, as a cath lab based study. We wanna characterize the burden of epicardial uh, coronary artery disease by angiography and intracoronary imaging. So people who meet our inclusion criteria both having anatomically uh, and physiologically non-obstructive coronary artery disease. Um, we want to see uh, how much atherosclerosis they actually do have um, when you look at it from a core lab. And uh, Daniel Sh uh, Shamie is on this call, and um, he'll be doing the core lab uh, imaging part of this. Uh, and then we'll characterize the natural history and outcomes of patients with ANOCA to determine um, the variables associated with long-term adverse events. And so we don't know if people with microvascular dysfunction are going to have heart outcome uh, events because of microvascular dysfunction or because they have a higher burden of atherosclerosis, and we really want to better understand that interplay. So we're going to look at angiographic anatomy, intravascular anatomy, and physiology, um, and see how that informs prognosis. We're taking um, a lot of patient uh, information, so demographics, um, how they present, whether it's unstable angina or a stable presentation, what their prior testing are. We're doing a symptom questionnaire. We're doing um, patient reported outcome measures before they're uh, even in, uh, tested. So after they consent, the first thing that they do is um, patient reported outcome measures. We're looking at um, the anatomic data that I mentioned. And then we're looking at the physiologic data and we're going to have uh, a fractional flow reserve on all of these vessels. We'll have a resting full cycle ratio, CFR, IMR, uh, and the results of the vasal reactivity testing. And then we're following patients um, at six months and then annually for five years. Um, we're actually going to be able to um, push uh, patient reported outcome measures to the patients at uh, follow up. So we're going to have serial assessments of quality of life and symptoms as well. So our study, um, Dr. Lansky is my um, co-principal investigator. We have an executive committee that has um, really phenomenal um, interventional cardiologists from around the country and um, uh, with Javier Escaned from around the world. The Yale Cardiovascular Research Group has been tremendous to work with with putting this together. It's, a it's been a huge effort over the last two years. And then we have 10 enrolling sites um, and we're about to activate our second site. So um, our enrollment is 500 participants over two years at 10 sites. Um, the uh, diagnostic assessment, angiogram, acetylcholine testing, uh, coronary physiology, uh, as we discussed today, and then uh, intracoronary imaging. This is all by protocol um, and uh, essentially um, agreed upon by our um, executive committee and investigators. Uh, patient reported outcome measures. Um, this is the uh, battery of four of them that we'll do as well as uh, we have a call center that's going to be doing follow-ups um, on patients. And so they'll be reaching out to the patients at 30 days, six months, 12 months, and then annually. Uh, 
Our primary endpoint is major adverse cardiovascular events. Um, these are all of the inclusion criteria. So essentially patients with suspected ischemic heart disease who are referred to undergo a clinically indicated invasive angiogram. And then they have to have no obstructive coronary artery disease, um, either with normal coronary arteries or non-obstructive um, with a stenosis less than 50%. Um, or if they have between 50 and 70% stenosis, an FFR or RFR that um, show that it's non-ischemic. These are not all of the exclusion criteria. Um, there uh, are quite a few more, but basically any MI um, we want to take out uh, because that clouds our, um, our outcome uh, assessment. Same thing with um, ejection fraction. We don't want anything less than 50%. Um, renal insufficiency, just to the point that it might make acetylcholine testing less safe uh, because of the increase, uh, potential increase in contrast values. Prior PCI, planned PCI, uh, prior cabbage, prior STEMI, valvular heart disease, and there's a few other exclusion criteria as well. So really stable patients coming in uh, with angina, uh, we want to enroll all of those patients. The angiographic exclusion criteria are um, obstructive disease by visual estimate or um, moderate uh, disease that's physiologically significant. And we're currently enrolling. So we enrolled our first two patients last week. We have another one that's planned to be um, uh, approached for the study next week. And so if you have any patients that you think uh, would qualify, please let me know. It's on clinicaltrials.gov um, and it's on the Yale Clinical Trials website as well. And so um, hopefully we're gonna lead this at Yale um, and be able to really change how we take care of patients in the cath lab. So um, I'll stop there and take any questions. Hey, Samit, great uh, presentation. I have a quick question about the assessment of EDP uh, as it relates to IMR. Is there any correlation in terms of um, you know, how the IMR gets influenced? Because some of the cases that you've shown, even though the FFRs were like 0.84 and not uh, something that we would intervene on based on several deferral trials and the FAME, but that those are still, you know, if you compare them to normal coronary flow, um, there are still obviously only 84% of that. So I was wondering if uh, in several of these patients, if how uh, do you routinely measure EDP and is that a consideration when you assess for IMR for a microcirculatory um, phenomenon? Thanks, Asim. Yeah, so um, I, I routinely measure EDP. Um, I kind of want to know um, and just put that in perspective. Uh, I also think it can help um, guide medical therapy. Often patients will be very hypertensive and have a high IMR, but um, their EDP will be really high. And so, you know, I think part of their medical therapy would be a diuretic. In terms of how it affects the IMR, so the, the expanded calculation for IMR um, includes that uh, part of it, the venous contribution um, to, to reducing um, coronary flow. Um, Bill Fearon, who really uh, derived this in a bench model and then um, in, in humans, uh, has done tests on this. And really, an EDP doesn't affect your IMR value until you get to EDPs around 30. Um, and so for most of our patients, um, the EDP is not going to um, contribute significantly. Uh, and really, um, in the setting of an MI, uh, IMR is still valid. Um, it does contribute in some way, but it doesn't necessarily reduce the diagnostic um, validity of it. Hey, Samit, that was a great presentation. Um, I don't know enough about, you know, the um, quality of life measures and the um, subjective assessments that you're doing, or maybe not, that's not right, subjective, but the um, questionnaire assessments you're doing in this, does any of that take into account things like depression, anxiety, stress, et cetera? Yeah, so one of our um, questionnaires is the GAD-7. So this is a generalized anxiety disorders questionnaire. And so we're trying to look specifically at the burden of um, uh, anxiety. And then actually PHQ-8 is to screen for depression. Um, and so uh, even if patients don't report, report over um, depression or anxiety disorders, we're going to have some um, formal assessment of that. Thanks. Jephthah has his virtual hand up. Um, so two questions for you. I mean, you referred to the myocardial bridging, and that's something that that's come up a few times. I think in cases that you um, that you and I have assessed. Um, what's your thoughts on that going forward, and, and expanding provocative testing to include that 
um, whether or not it's visible at rest. And then secondly, probably a bigger question is, um, for the non-provocative part of the testing, would you suggest or hope that we would incorporate that into our routine assessment of Inoka and Minoka patients in whom there, there is no epicardial disease, but who had convincing stories? Like, should that just be something that we routinely do at this point? Yeah, so for, for bridging, I, you know, my um, take on bridging is that I just keep it in mind um, as, you know, another part of this. And so let's say I do functional testing and um, people don't have spasm, people don't have microvascular disease, and I see a bridge or we have CT evidence of a bridge, I think it's worth assessing. And so um, in the Discover Anoka protocol, we did not um, build dobutamine testing for bridges into it. There are centers that do do this routinely. And so we had a, you know, our second patient that we enrolled actually had a, um, a 1.5 centimeter bridge by CTA. Angiographically, you know, it's the kind of bridge that we see um, from time to time. And uh, really his syndrome was a symptomatic bridge and we did dobutamine testing on him to show that. And so uh, the nice thing about this protocol is that bridges do have endothelial dysfunction and spasm. Um, and so I, this whole, you know, going through this stepwise, doing the angiogram, seeing the bridge, doing acetylcholine, putting the wire down, it's all part of that assessment. And then if you see a bridge, you, the, you know, the next step is just to give dobutamine um, to, to challenge it. And so um, the wire that we, you know, that we're using the pressure wire X, uh, you just switch to RFR mode and then you can ascend, you know, just run dobutamine and go from five micrograms per kilogram per minute to 10 to 20 to see how low it can get. And so, uh, you know, we did a patient, a young man at the VA a few months ago, and his never really got to an ischemic range, even at 20 micrograms of dobutamine, which despite having um, some chest pain and um, that was, you know, brought on by loading conditions, uh, there was a really low suspicion that his bridge was significant. Um, but in other people, um, you will see significant bridges. Uh, it's generally in younger people that we worry about them. Um, it's hard to believe that in somebody who's, you know, 60, 70, 80 years old, that a bridge has suddenly become physiologically significant. And then the second question. So if you, yeah, if, you know, in terms of ease of use, putting the pressure wire down is very similar to doing an FFR. And so um, we're all comfortable with putting a guide up and putting that wire in the coronary. So as long as you're, you know, being thoughtful about it, giving nitro before you put the wire down, flushing everything with saline when you equalize, um, there's a lot of value to at least ruling out microvascular disease. So for example, um, somebody comes in, uh, they have um, chest pain or shortness of breath, do the pressure wire part of it um, and do an IMR and see if they have microvascular disease. If they don't, then essentially you're either left with non-cardiac chest pain or vasospasm. And so as long as we're appropriately guarded with our recommendations that um, we're not totally definitive that they, you know, uh, which one of that it's going to be, the referring you know, provider then can either give them nitrates or calcium channel blockers and see if that helps, but they would have some um, uh, reassurance that it's not epicardial coronary artery disease and it is or isn't microvascular disease. Hey, Sumit, one other, one other question. Uh, in several of your patients that you've done, do you have um, any of these patients have had like assessment of CFR with non-invasive assessment and how do they correlate with what you found in the cath lab? Uh, so is there a role for, you know, evolving our protocols and for example, in the PET scanners to, you know, mirror what you're doing? Yeah, so you, Cecia Galagos actually um, presented uh, the correlation between um, an invasive IMR and a PET um, uh, flow reserve uh, at ACC, I think in 2018. And so we do have decent correlation between those two. That's kind of what started a lot of this is that there was a patient who um, was a high ranking government official who had multiple angiograms. And then um, when I was a fellow with Dr. Frau, we eventually tested her and um, were able to show that she had uh, microvascular disease and a low CFR. And when they went back and looked at the PET data, if they correlated with, if they uh, corrected for the rate pressure product, um, the CFRs were pretty similar. And so there is a correlation there. There's a study that looked at oxygen-15 water PET um, versus thermodilution coronary flow reserve, and those correlate less well. But we know that already, that thermodilution coronary flow reserve is very dependent on loading conditions. And so um, I actually uh, um, contacted the uh, senior author of that um, paper, um, Niels van Royen, and he uh, they have the IMR values, and he kind of capitulated that the IMR values 
correlates a lot better um, with a reduced PET CFR. So uh, it is another, you know, I have patients that I see as an outpatient for this. And so if they've already had an angiogram and it's, their symptoms are not worth sending them for another angiogram, um, I will get PET stress tests to try to look for microvascular disease because um, it does correlate. I wouldn't necessarily say that one is a better gold standard than another. It's all kind of adding to the information that we have for the patient. Any other questions? Thank you, Samit, for presenting. That's an excellent presentation. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, we're past the hour, so we'll see you guys next Wednesday. Thanks a lot.